Hey, hey there, my friends, my dear brothers and sisters. India, Shua Hamashiach. How you doing there? Laden Schmal coming to you here from FEMA region number three. And how about another summer moment? That's what I call it, summer moment. I did it once before. Remember, I come on here, and I was telling you about how I was in prayer to our Abba Father, and he said unto me, Lebm, well, you know, to my heart. <laughs> Open up the book of Psalms, and just, just pick one. Just kind of close your eyes, put it in your finger, and pick a psalm. And you read it to the... To the dear brothers and sisters. And then you talk about it a little bit. You know. So I thought I'd do it again. We'll have ourselves a psalm of the moment. Let's see if we got here. I got the uh, hallelujah scriptures here. Let's see. Tehillim. Tehillim. Number 55. 5-5. Five, five. Number of grace. <laughs> All right. Psalm number 55. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Let's get with it. Psalm of a moment. Psalm number 55. A Psalm of David. Now, before I actually get on with it, let me tell you a little story. You see, there is no greater thing than we can do than to build one another up with encouraging words and, and tell one another when prayer is answered and confirmed. And what I'm going to tell you right now will do just that, my friends, and it will show you without a doubt that our Abba, our Father, is active in our lives at every moment. You're going to love this. Now, the Father first put it on my heart to do the Psalm of the Moment on the 29th of March of 2016, of course. So, what I did, even though I was working on another video, uh, this one uh, right here, I decided to record the introduction for the first edition of Psalm of the Moment while I had the camera on, you know. So I recorded the intro for the video I did on Psalm 73. Then I prayed. I said, Abba, Father, please bless this endeavor and give me the ability to rightly divide your word and let me know. Let me know if it is your will that I do the Psalms in this manner. And after the prayer, I thought I might as well open the Psalms again, close my eyes, and pick another, and then record that intro so as I'd have a little head start, should it be the Father's will that I continue on with this. So I did. I put my finger in, and it landed smack vap on Psalm 55. Then on May the 15th, I posted the first edition which featured Psalm 73, a Psalm of Asaph. I hope you are able to join in that study. Well, my friends, I began getting comments on the video, the one on Psalm 73, about an hour or so after I posted it. And one of the comments was my confirmation and the answer to my prayer. And it was the third, the third comment to be posted. <laughs> it was from a dear sister, and it read as follows. Oh, Lem, I needed this. I wondered why my persecution is getting stronger. I read the Psalms, especially... Psalm 55. <laughs> Thank you. Can't wait to get off this cross. Maranatha. Almost time to go home. Oh, dear sister, thank you so much for this. Oh, it did my heart good when I saw that comment of yours. And here now is a study dedicated to you on Psalm 55. Oh, Abba. Father, please give me the ability to rightly divide your word at this time. May it edify and bring comfort to all those who join in this study, especially the dear sister who has expressed a love for this particular psalm written by your servant David. And I ask this in the Kodesh name of our Savior Yeshua. Amen. And Maranatha. And now, my friends, let us read together one of the most soul-wrenching pieces of scripture ever inspired by the Ruach HaKadosh. Oh, prepare your hearts for this one, my brothers and sisters. It truly is soul-wrenching. Let us read. 
Psalm 55 to the chief singer on stringed instruments, a poem of David. In the uh, Hallelujah Scriptures, it says the very poem. Give ear to my prayer, O Elohim, and do not hide yourself from my plea. Give heed to me and answer me. I wander and moan in my complaint because of the noise of the enemy, because of the outcry of the wicked, for they bring wickedness down upon me, and in wrath they hate me. Verse 4. My heart is pained within me, and the fear of death has fallen upon me. Fear and trembling have come upon me, and shuddering covers me. And I said, who would give me wings like a dove? Oh, I would fly away and be at rest. See, I would wander far off. I would lodge in the wilderness. Selah. Verse 8. I would hasten my escape from the raging and the storm. Confuse, O Yahweh. Divide their tongues, for I saw violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on the walls. Wickedness and trouble are also in the midst of it. Coverings are in its midst. Oppression and deceit do not vanish from its streets. Verse 12. It is not an enemy that reproaches me. That I could bear. Nor one who hates me who is making himself great against me. Then I could hide from him. Verse 13. But it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my friend. We took sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of Elohim in the throng. Let death come upon them. Let them go down into the grave alive. For evil is in their dwellings, in their midst. Verse 16. I, I call upon Elohim. And Yahweh saves me. Evening and morning and noon I complain and moan, and he hears my voice. He has redeemed my life in peace from the battle against me, for there were many against me. El, even he who dwells from of old, hears and afflicts them. Selah those of whom there are no changes, those who do not revere Elohim. Verse 20, he has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. His mouth was smoother than curds, yet in his heart is fighting. His words were softer than oil, but they are drawn swords. Verse 22, cast your burden on Yahweh and let him sustain you. He never allows the righteous to be shaken. For you, O Elohim, bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of blood and deceit do not reach half their days. But I, I trust in you. O Elohim, may your name be praised in all the earth. Amen and Maranatha. Now let us go back and break it down. Brothers and sisters, it would be gross neglect to say that this psalm is not overflowing with statements and sentiments that we all can apply to our own lives, and we will discuss that more later. But we must also remember that even though these writings are called psalms or poems or songs, the events and the emotions described within them are real, tangible things that were going on in the real and tangible life of this particular psalmist, King David. They were not just his musings. As I pointed out when we discussed Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph, the reason why the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, did not allow the psalmists to be absolutely specific in what was going on in their respective lives, but so that we could apply those situations recorded to our own existences. But there were definitely specific things 
that were happening to those people, to those men that wrote these songs. And I believe that we will discover that this is certainly the case here with David in his psalm that has been numbered 55. Verses 1 and 2. Give ear to my prayer, O Elohim, and do not hide yourself from my plea. Give heed to me and answer me. I wander and moan in my complaint. So, my friends, what words do you think stand out in these two verses, hmm? Well, to me, it is these two words right here. I and wander. I wander in my complaint. By these two words, Laban, you may ask unto yourself, friends, there are eleven, eleven psalms of David that begin with him, that is David, crying out to Yahweh in prayer because he is in distress. These eleven right here. And out of all of these, there is only one that indicates that he is up and moving around wandering while he prays. Is that significant? I think it is. Read the verse again. Give heed to me and answer me. I wander and moan in my complaint. You know what he's doing here? He's pacing the floor. That's what he's doing. You know, when you get all worked up about something and you can't sit, you gotta pace, you gotta wander around, and sometimes you might even pound onto something, pound the wall. That's what's going on here, I believe. Because as I said, look at all them psalms there that start out with him crying out to Elohim. But this one, this Psalm 55, the only one that indicates that he was wandering around. He is restless in this distress, unable to settle himself again. No other of David's psalms give us this picture. And uh, let's think about this a moment. What sort of problems cause one to pace the floor whilst they moan in their complaint? Uh, a sick family member? Financial debt? A plot, perhaps, going on behind one's back? <laughs> now, which of these seems to apply most to the life of this man, the king, the anointed of Elohim, this David? Well, with regards to uh, this man, I think we can definitely rule out financial problems. And we only read of one instance where David is in distress over the infirmity of a loved one. And that, of course, was the dire straits that his infant son by Bathsheba was in before his death. And even here, when David besought Yahweh for the child to live, it says this. It says he lay all night upon the earth. So while his child was dying, he was not up and about. But here, here in Psalm 55, he wanders in his distress. And as I pointed out, this is the only psalm that records such a thing. So I'm going with an evil plot against him, but not necessarily one that we are familiar with. You'd think he'd be used to that sort of thing by now, huh? Man, oh man. But you know, when people that you trust betray you, no. No, you can never get used to that. Not unless, you know, you're like some kind of psychopath or a Democrat or something, you know? Psychopath, Democrat, same thing. All right, now let's go back to verse 2 and read through to verse 5. Give heed to me and answer me. I wander and moan in my complaint. Verse 3. Because of the noise of the enemy, because of the outcry of the wicked, for they bring wickedness down upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is pained within me, and the fears of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling have come upon me, and shuddering covers me. All right, we see here that things look pretty bad for the king. David fears for his life. And take particular notice of this here, where it says, And shuddering covers me. Now, as you know, the translation that I am using right here is the Hallelujah Scriptures. But in most of the popular English translation, it reads this way, And horror overwhelms me. Horror. 
Can you imagine that? That's powerful. Again, no other psalm of David starts out within the opening verses with such a word as horror or even the idea. This David, the man called a man after Yahweh's own heart, is scared, seemingly out of his wits, as to use a word such as horror, and it appears to be an issue which does not present the ability for him to remain on his knees in his supplication to Elohim. He is moaning and pacing and what? Shuddering in horror. So it seems here that whatever it is that's coming on could be life or death. It could even be that this wandering that he's doing is sort of him looking out, you know, keeping an eye out for something like, like that could just jump out at him. Remember how he was always on edge because of having to look out for Saul? Seems like it's something like this, but even worse. Because in the psalms that he wrote that had to do with Saul, he did not express horror. Hmm. So perhaps it is not something physical that he is afraid of, but things that are going on in his mind, things that are being done to him psychologically. That, my friends, as many of us know, can be much, much worse than having something physical happen to you. So whatever it is that is causing David such distress have to do with causing him harm both physically and mentally. I do believe that. I can think of three prominent times when such thoughts rose up in the minds of the great king's enemies, one of which was before he was king, his pursuit by his father-in-law and predecessor, King Saul, his betrayal by his third son, Absalom, and then his betrayal by yet another son, Adonijah, David's fourth son who was born of David's wife, Haggith. You know, now, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it meant the same thing back then, but uh, don't you think you might want to avoid marrying a woman whose name starts with Hag? Just a thought. All right, so do you think that it's one of these plots that's got David all keyed up? I don't think so. But Laban, these were the biggies. Saul wanted David dead. Absalom wanted David dead. Adonijah wanted him dead. That's one jealous king and two rebellious princes. Who else could have had enough power to cause such fear, trembling, and literal shuddering to rise up in such a man as David? One who killed his tens of thousands. Well, let me tell you, we can rule Adonijah out just by looking at verse 2. And the two words that I said stood out in the verse. I wonder. How's that, Laban? Well, David was completely and utterly bedridden at the time of Adonijah's betrayal and rebellion. In fact, he was dying, and he had to have some young woman lie there with him all the time just to keep him warm. So, his fears of death that are causing him to wander in Psalm 55 cannot have to do with the plot of Adonijah, because when that was going on, David was literally dying and could in no ways pace the floor. David is very, very sick and quite old by the time we got to the book of First Kings. So we rule out Adonijah. Can we rule out the plot of King Saul? Well, yeah, let's read on, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6, And I said, Who would give me wings like a dove? I would fly away and be at rest. See, I would wander far off. I would lodge in the wilderness. Selah. And what does that Selah mean? You know what it means? <laughs> it means stew on that a while. <laughs> Actually, what it means is when they put that in there, it uh, indicates they want you to pause and reflect on what you just read, or perhaps it was even a uh, musical interlude. So we can't be 100% sure exactly what Selah meant, but for our purposes, we'll say it means stew on that a while. <laughs> And I believe that we can certainly stew on the fact that from what we just read, it's not King Saul that's bothering David in this here Psalm 55. How's that, Laban? Well, read again with me verse 7. See, I would wander far off, I would lodge in the wilderness. Now, where was David the majority of the time that he was being pursued by Saul? He was in the wilderness. And here in this psalm, it says he would go. 
to the wilderness for rest. If, of course, he was given wings of a dove, he would wander far off into the wilderness. And here we see a further proof that this could not have been during the time of Adonijah's plot. So I believe that David's fearful situation here in Psalm 55 has neither to do with Adonijah or Saul. But let's ask ourselves a question. It's something extremely interesting and will also confirm that we are most in Elohim's care during times of extreme trial and persecution. Ask yourself this. Why would David want to run to the wilderness? Symbolically, the wilderness in Scripture always represents a fiery trial of some sort. This is where David was forced to be during his persecution by Saul. So why would he want to return there? Well, I'll tell you why. Because every time, yes, every time, that David was given amazing strength from Elohim to overcome his adversaries, he, that is David, was where? In the wilderness. David's times of weakness were never when he was in the wilderness, but when he was in a city or a populated area. Think about it. Where was David when Elohim sent him his mighty men? He was in the wilderness. And both times David was given the chance to kill Saul, but did not. He was in the wilderness. Now verse 8 is the clincher. Verse 8 tells us that even though David was on the run, he associated the wilderness with the times that Elohim rescued him from his enemies. What does verse 8 say? I would hasten my escape from the raging wind and storm. So we learn right here, my friends, that lodging in the wilderness would hasten escape for him. Recall, if you will, the events of First Samuel chapter 23. David is in the wilderness of Maon, and Saul is pursuing him around a mountain, when suddenly, that's right, suddenly, a messenger runs up to Saul and says, Hey, the Philistines have invaded the land. So what does Saul have to do? He's got to go, and he's got to let David go. <laughs> now take another look at verse 8. I would hasten my escape from the raging wind and storm. And now read First Samuel 23, 28. So Shaul, that's Saul, turned back from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place Salah Hamalachoth. And do you know what that means? Ha <laughs> ha! The rock of escape! Ha <laughs> ha! Do you see? David was closer in spirit to Elohim when he was in the wilderness, and thus he was safer, and thus was given greater strength to overcome adversity. Think even of David's triumph over Goliath. Where was he? Was he in town? No, he was on a battlefield. Where did David kill the lion and the bear? He was all alone out there in a the field. He wasn't in no city or around lots of people. Now, granted, a battlefield and a pasture are not exactly the wilderness, but they're more like a wilderness than a city is. In the wilderness, he always sought the counsel of Elohim. Conversely, there was David always in trouble, and mostly because of his own stupidity and taking matters into his own hands. He was in a city or a village of some sort. Where was he when he lied to the priests of Yahweh? He was in Nob. And where was he? Then he pretended to be crazy, you know, mad, frothing all up at the mouth like a nut. He was in Gath, which, of course, is a city. And where was he living when the Philistines told him to get lost, and where everything he had was burned, and his people were taken captive by the Amalekites? He was in Ziklag, the city. And oh, ho, ho, where was he when he went up on the roof? And rub-a-dub-dub, Bathsheba in the tub. <laughs> Jerusalem. And needless to say, that's a city. So we see here in Psalm 55 that David would seemingly rather be in the wilderness than where he was right at that moment, which we will discover shortly in the psalm is the city. And I believe it is safe to rule out the persecution by Saul and the rebellion of Adonijah as the source of David's problems here in Psalm 55. Let's read on. Verses 9 through 11. Confuse, O Yahweh, divide their tongues, for I saw violence and strife in the city. Ha <laughs> ha, there you go. 
Verse 10, day and night they go around it on the walls. Wickedness and trouble are also in the midst of it. Covenings are in its midst. Oppression and deceit do not vanish from its streets. There you go, my friends. Doesn't seem like David is too fond of the city. Look how he describes it. Violent, hidden with strife, wicked, troublesome, covetous, oppressive, and deceitful. Brothers and sisters, never, never did David ever describe their wilderness in such a terrible, terrible manner. And now, my friends, we come to the telltale part of the song. The issue that has got David in such a horrific state, and where we can also rule out his son Absalom as its culprit. Gird your loins. Let's read verses 12 through 14. It is not an enemy who reproaches me. That I could bear. No one who hates me, who is making himself great against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my friend. We took sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of Elohim in the throng his companion and his friend. Now, for anyone with even a nominal knowledge of David's life, when it comes to a companion and a friend, you might right off the bat, smack that. Think about Jonathan, the son of Saul. But don't even entertain that thought for even a nanosecond. Aside from the fact that Jonathan was dead when the psalm was written, the two men were never equals. Even though Elohim had already rejected Saul as king and had Samuel anoint David, while Jonathan was alive, David still thought of him as heir to the throne. Even though David had been anointed, he would not have lorded himself over Jonathan. Now, had Jonathan lived, Jonathan would have submitted to David's rule, and of course, David would have accepted that. So Jonathan is not the man. And I got one more even though for you. Even though the point is a moot one, nowhere in the scriptures is Jonathan ever referred to as David's companion and or friend. We are told that they were as one spirit, and in his life there was no one on earth that David was closer to than Jonathan. But as I said, scripture never describes Jonathan as a companion and or a friend. And while we're at it, Rule out all the sons, because <laughs> David never equals, of course. And then we got uh, David's biological brothers. Could it have been one of them? No. And why is that lame? Well, David never equals. <laughs> uh, before David was king, he was their younger brother. He was the youngest of the seven, so he would have been subordinate to them. And then, of course, when he became king, they were subordinate unto him. So rule out the bio brothers. And as another aside, nowhere in scripture are his biological brothers ever described as his companion or friend. So what can we deduce thus far, my friends? Well, I believe that the evidence is beginning to show that this horrific, gut-wrenching, fearsome situation that David is writing of in Psalm 55 took place sometime between the rebellion of Absalom and the rebellion of Adonijah. For this was also when David would have most likely been in Jerusalem for a longer stretch of time. Now let me tell you something here, people. We cannot uh, with 100% assurity prove that the person about to be revealed is the one that David is writing about in this psalm. A man his equal, his companion, and his friend. But there is only one person that scripture itself does describe as David's companion and friend. The exact words that David uses in Psalm 55 to describe this person. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 37, we find that he is called his friend. And in 2 Samuel 16, verses 16 and 17, he is called his friend twice. And scripture gives us one more. In 1 Chronicles, chapter 27, verse 33, we see that this person is called David's companion four times. 
we get four assurances from Scripture. And as Psalm 55 itself proves, David uses those exact words, companion and friend. And so, with regard to this person whom has somehow brought David to the point of fearing death here in Psalm 55, the Scriptures themselves point to only one, only one person. Are you ready? Yes, that's right. Hushai, Hushai the Archite, the very man who saved David's life by defeating the advice of Ahithophel, who had become Absalom's main counselor during his rebellion against his father David. And this was no small feat, mind you. For in, in 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, we are told that asking the advice of Ahithophel was like that of inquiring at the oracle of Yahweh. So Hushai had to be very, very good with words to out-counsel one such as Ahithophel and thus destroy Absalom's rebellion. And by destroying Absalom's rebellion, Hushai single-handedly saved the life of David. This could have been the very deed that would have caused David to call Hushai his equal. Could another such deed be its equal? <laughs> and you know, my friends, there was a verse in this psalm that puzzled me until I considered the fact that David's life was saved by Hushai. It was the last sentence of verse 12. Then I could hide from you. This puzzled me. But then I thought about it. <laughs> Even if at a later time the person had done you wrong, I think it would still be a very difficult thing to hide from someone who had saved your life. Mm. Mm. Oh, my friends, this is very, very distressing. Hushai is the only person in Scripture to ever be called David's companion and his friend. And so what does this tell us? It tells us something very, very sad. That if Hushai is the man, it shows us that for the majority of his life, David, the man after Yahweh's own heart, didn't have a real, true friend in the whole world that he could think of as an equal. And this certainly made David a type of Christ. And to make it even more heartbreaking than it is already, if in fact it is Hushai, look where Scripture first mentions Hushai. Look at the place where the names David and Hushai first appear together. Let's read verse 15. Let death come upon them. Let them go down into the grave alive, for evil is in their dwellings, in their midst. This verse is very telling, my friends, and it harkens back to verse 9, in which David cries out to Elohim, asking him to confuse and divide the tongues of his enemies. It is in this verse 15 that David is perhaps thinking that it was others who may have been involved, ones who may have unduly influenced his friend to turn on him. How many of us have experienced outsiders coming into our lives and upsetting the proverbial apple cart, for lack of a better analogy? But I think you see what I'm getting at. But once again, we're seeing a light, a light at the end of that tunnel, my friends. <laughs> Read verses 16 through 19. Here we see David showing his old self and his trust in his only hope. Let us read verses 16 through 19. I, I call upon Elohim, and Yahweh saves me. Evening and morning and noon I complain and moan, and he hears my voice. Verse 18, he has redeemed my life in peace from the battle against me, for there were many against me. El, even he who dwells from of old, hears and afflicts them. Selah, 
In other words, stew on that a while. <laughs> those of whom there are no changes, those who do not revere Elohim. There you go, my friends, Elohim will certainly afflict them. And now, my brothers and sisters, a turn of thought occurs here in verses 20 and 21. David's mind is once again assaulted by the acts of his traitorous ex-companion and friend. Let us read verses 20 and 21. He has put forth his hand against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. His mouth was smoother than curds, yet in his heart is fighting. His words were softer than oil, but they are drawn swords. Ho, oh, ho! Dear brothers and sisters, I regret to say that I believe that these verses give further evidence that Hushai is the man. Recall Ahithophel, whose counsel was like that of consulting a prophet of Yahweh. So in light of this, it only stands to reason that Hushai must have been very eloquent and very persuasive to outsmart one such as Ahithophel. Look at how David puts it. He says that this man's mouth was smoother than curds, and his words were softer than oil. Sounds to me that only a smooth talker could have swayed Absalom to reject Ahithophel, who felt so beaten by Hushai that he went home to the city and hung himself. Now, like I said before, we can't say with 100% assurity that David was describing Hushai here as the uh, person who reproached him, but Scripture gives us no other person who comes close to fitting the description. Let me know, dear friends, in the comments section your thoughts on this. Please do. And now, for the closing words of this remarkable Psalm 55, Words that show how King David always comes around and gives the glory to his Elohim. Let us read verses 22 and 23. Cast your burden on Yahweh and let him sustain you. He never allows the righteous to be shaken. For you, O Elohim, bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of blood and deceit do not reach half their days, but I, I trust in you. Oh, my goodness, my brothers and sisters, what a remarkable psalm of David. See how it ends. It ends as the psalm we previously studied, Psalm 73. Notice how it began with great sorrow and ends in what? Trusting Elohim, O oh, Elohim of hosts, may your name be praised in all the earth. Now, friends, in closing, let me point out that even if Hushai is the man who brought such misery to David, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, did not allow David to divulge what terrible act was done to him. Why? so that all of us can relate to what David was going through in the psalm, and so that we can know that we are not and have never been alone in whatever the trial may be. Oh, ho, ho, my dear brothers and sisters, and especially you, the dear sister who sent me the comment about how much she loved this particular psalm, I hope and I pray that you were blessed and edified in this study that we have done together. <laughs> oh, 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 my brothers and sisters, let us now bow our hearts toward our Father, which art in the Shamaim. Oh, Elohim, Elohim in the Shamaim, we thank you with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls for your living word, this this light unto our path, this lamp unto our feet. Oh, what would we do without it? 
It is so precious to us as we occupy here on this earth until until your son, your precious babe, your Yeshua calls us up to meet him in the clouds where we will be with him forever. Oh my goodness, what a day that will be. And we ask you to give us the strength to hold on and to obey and to stay in your living word until then. And we ask all of this in the precious Kodesh name of Yeshua. Amen. And Maranatha. <laughs> Until next time, my friends. And another summer moment. <laughs> you know, you can pick your own, you know. You can do it on your own, any kind. <laughs> zip, zip, zip. Now you be warm. <laughs>